It's my pleasure tonight to introduce George Marsden, who is the McEnany Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Marsden is, in my opinion, uh, the Academy's most influential advocate for and practitioner of Christian scholarship. Uh, Professor Marsden is best known, indeed notorious in some circles, uh, for his advocacy of Christian perspectives along this, uh, alongside the scientific naturalism of much uh, research scholarship. He made this case most effectively in the books The Soul of the American University, 1994, and The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship, 1997. Even more important than his advocacy is his practice of Christian scholarship. Among his other publications are The Evangelical Mind and the New School Presbyterian Experience, 1970, which I saw today has also come up out in a paperback edition. Um, many people considered that book a cult classic. I think the original only got maybe 150 copies or something like that, so I think people are going to be scrambling to get a copy of that now. Uh, Fundamentalism in American Culture, 1980, Reforming Fundamentalism, Fuller Seminary and the New Ev Evangelicalism, 1987, and Jonathan Edwards, A Life, 2003. Besides Soul of the American University and uh, the Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship, uh, George is probably best known for Fundamentalism in American Culture, which essentially invented the study of the history of American fundamentalism. And it was also named, uh, among many other honors it's gotten, is it was named one of the 100 most important books of the 20th century by Christianity Today. Uh, his brilliant biography, Jonathan Edwards, A Life, uh, similarly capped a generation of studies of America's most important theologian, Edwards. And this book won a host, a host of prizes from professional history organizations including Columbia University's Bancroft Prize, the top award within the field of American history. Professor Marsden received his PhD from Yale University, and he taught at Calvin College and Duke University before finishing his teaching career at the University of Notre Dame and then Harvard Divinity School, where he spent last uh, academic year. And although I'm not sure he would regard it as a highlight of his career, at Notre Dame, he once uh, struggled through directing a doctoral dissertation by a marginal student named Tommy Kidd. <laughs> and uh, I, I could say a whole lot about that, but uh, <laughs> uh, George remains my most important intellectual influence, and he's also a good friend. His address tonight is uh, the Protestant ethos and the spirit of secular America, the rise of worldview, worldview naturalism in the universities as a case study. And George, on behalf of your many friends and admirers here, I th say thank you for your work and your example to us, and welcome back to Baylor. Thank you, Tommy, for that very kind introduction, and it's a real joy to have students like Tommy and some other students of mine who are out here, and uh, it's one of the great pleasures of being in this profession, and I'm always glad to be back at Baylor, and Baylor becomes a more and more exciting place uh, by, from, from year to year, and, and uh, th this conference is really a wonderful example, so I'm grateful to Darren and all the people he thanked for putting together this wonderful conference and for the, the scholars who are uh, assembled here. The Protestant ethos and the spirit of secular America, the rise of worldview naturalism in the universities is a case study. In 1900, white male Protestants, Protestant elites presided over American colleges and universities as they did over American culture generally. At that time, higher education was still regarded as, as an area of culture related to Christianity, as it had been since its founding uh, in the, the Middle Ages. Most colleges and universities in 1900 still required daily chapel services 
and voluntary evangelical groups such as the YMCA, the YM, YWCA, which is sort of like intervarsities groups at, at that time, flourished. And e even though faith and learning were seldom well integrated, when academic leaders spoke of the moral goals of education, they typically acknowledged some role for at least transcendent ideals that they saw as having at least congeniality with their religious heritage. By the 1930s, white male elites still ruled, but dramatic changes had taken place regarding intellectual authority. Except in churches and among professional theologians, few intellectual leaders even considered religious or transcendent factors in determining the truth of most matters. Elite university professors, although almost all of Protestant lineage, were, li uh, were likely to think that as a matter of principle, religious faith should have no bearing on their disciplines. Most such leading professors had adopted the consensus view that the natural scientific model provided the definitive intellectual authority often explicitly in contrast to the authority of matters of faith. They did acknowledge, of course, that the natural scientific method could not be applied to all matters, particularly the creative arts and to some aspects of personal religious experience. Yet such matters were considered to be supplementary human activities. Uh, <clears throat> Art, art, art or religion might go beyond science, but they ought to be engaged in ways that would not violate or challenge the authority of natural, the natural scientific method in all areas where it could be applied, including for understanding the basic truths of the universe and the human condition. Crucial to the uh, modern natural scientific method was that by definition, it excluded considerations of matters beyond nature. Uh, that rule had become well accepted by the later 19th century, and while not entirely uncontroversial, was easily defensible, particularly because of its uh, proven usefulness uh, for promoting specialized knowledge based on investigation of natural causes alone. That useful Methodog methodological rule, however, soon helped pre pre precipitate a much wider ideological revolution, and that's what I want to talk about this evening. With little more than, uh, within little more than a generation, the natural scientific model was commonly extended to become the gold standard for truth-seeking in all areas where it can conceiv could conceivably be applied. Or, to change the metaphor, it was like a palace revolution in which an invaluable servant became a domineering master. Proponents of the natural scientific method, so effective as it was for understanding nature and technology, successfully established it as the primary ruling authority for understanding human nature, society, and even morality as well. More breathtaking in scope were widely credited areas efforts to extend the natural scientific authority so, so that its standards might in fact dictate the metaphysics of the entire universe. Many academics and other intellectuals read, readily accepted the proposition that that which could not be known by, the natural, by natural scientific investigation or by logical necessity had no standing as intellectual authority. Uh, that, that that argument, uh, for, that the argument for that view involved victory by definition. Uh, science was defined as the investigation of natural causes alone, and now, natu and now natural science was declared to be uh, the highest intellectual authority, did not greatly limit its popularity among intellectuals. So one part of my historical question is the following. How is it that in the mid 20th century, from about 19, the 1910s to uh, 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 until the later 1960s, so many intellectuals and academics came to review, to review 
worldview naturalism as not just one point of view among many, but as simply being objective and unbiased. Many, now not by no means all, but many saw it as simply the consensus view towards wh toward which all right thinking was headed. Many uh, such intellectuals viewed such a consistent uh, scientific outlook as free from metaphysics. So it was not so much a point of view as it was just freeing yourself of prejudices. That such an outlook could become uh, widely plausible uh, stands in contrast uh, to the late 19th century when after the advent of Darwinism, metaphysical naturalism emerged as an increasingly viable uh, intellectual outlook, but it was still widely regarded uh, in the 19th century as a sectarian point of view. Likewise today, even though worldview naturalism still has many dogmatic advocates, it's widely recognized even among secular intellectuals as just one point of view uh, among many. And I think this is uh, well illustrated if you look at some of the reviews of the, the new atheists uh, in uh, the mainstream uh, media. For instance, uh, one striking one, New York Times uh, book review, uh, Leon uh, Weisletier, uh, literary editor of the New Republic, wrote in, in 2006 uh, this. Scientism, the view that science can explain all <clears throat> human conditions and expressions, uh, mental as well as physical, is a superstition. One of the dominant superstitions of our day, and it's not an insult to science to say so. For a sorry instance of present day scientism, it's hard to improve on Daniel C. Dennett's book. Uh, and Terry Eagleton, a uh, Marxist, has recently uh, won considerable uh, attention. Uh, by characterizing Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett, uh, uh, AKA as Ditchkins, uh, as uh, like religious fundamentalists in their militancy uh, in uh, advocating uh, worldview naturalism. Uh, and, and you might have noticed there was a, a favorable uh, comment in the New Yorker about that kind of criticism of, of, of naturalism. So today, uh, it's, naturalism isn't uh, that widely, t even though it's very widely accepted, isn't that widely seen as just simply being objective. It's seen as more a uh, one view among, uh, among many. So my question is, uh, in, in the middle decade, why, why did it happen? That in the middle decades of the 20th century, despite uh, the presence of sub substantial critical alternatives through their outlook, and even uh, th through the era of religious revivals in the 1950s, worldview naturalists in most intellectual circles could get away with speaking of theirs as a consensus or the default view, uh, and that only other outlooks were sectarian. As I have in already intimated, I think the crucial distinction to make in explaining these developments is the distinction between methodological naturalism, or the practice of excluding all but natural forces uh, for a limited uh, inquiry or activity, uh, and metaphysical naturalism, or uh, world, worldview naturalism, as a comprehensive worldview, as a view of everything. Historically, these two have been very closely related, and, and intellectual activity uh, was already limited to the examination of natural causes uh, alone, then extending that rule to be the norm uh, for interpreting all of reality uh, might appear to make little practical difference. The only areas where worldview naturalism would seem to get seriously in the way uh, were in the increasingly marginal disciplines of theology and of metaphysics itself. In most intellectual disciplines, proponents of worldview naturalism had no need to identify themselves as such, since one's metaphysics were supposed to make no practical difference uh, to uh, their practical uh, inquiries. 
or if they chose to advocate a wholly naturalistic worldview, they could do so while standing on the high ground of intellectual consistency. And in an era when many still believed in cumulative intellectual progress, champions of consistent worldview naturalism could plausibly proclaim that their outlook uh, was the position toward which all right-thinking people uh, were headed. So the ubiquity of methodological naturalism in modern life played, uh, since the ubiquity of methodological naturalism in modern life uh, played such a large role in clearing the way, away the obstacles for the acceptance of uh, metaphysical or, wor or worldview naturalism uh, as at least a strong candidate to be the default or the common sense position uh, for mid 20th century intellectuals, uh, we need to take a, a, a stop and, and take a, a look or think about what methodological uh, naturalism uh, involves or implies. Because of the fact of the matter is that uh, whether we are religious believers or not, uh, we all engage in methodological uh, naturalism probably most of the time, uh, particularly in the modern world. As a matter of course, uh, almost all of us exclude uh, considerations of anything but natural forces in, imply, in, in, in uh, employing the technology uh, with which we are uh, increasingly surrounded. Uh, if the pilot uh, is landing in a storm, uh, we don't want to hear her come on the intercom and say, don't worry folks, I'm trusting in the leading of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we might, it's fine uh, if she offers a prayer, uh, but we want her uh, to rely on the instruments. And so, uh, in most of our lives, uh, we, uh, uh, and, and for a long time, uh, much of our public life, including almost all, of business and government uh, have been defined by technological principles. And so practically speaking, methodological naturalism is a default position for most people in modern societies most of the time, including, I think, all of us. Uh, so religious believers may gather in a room uh, seeking illumination from the Holy Spirit, uh, but nonetheless, they're going to turn on the lights or more importantly, the uh, overhead and, and the computers uh, just the same way uh, that non-believers do. Now it used to be widely believed by sociologists that these features of modernity that I'm describing under the rubric of methodological naturalism uh, would inevitably uh, lead uh, to secularization and to the decline of theistic uh, religion. I just ran into a quote of that from T.H. Uh, Huxley back in the, in the 19th century saying uh, everyone's naturalist already and pretty soon religion's going to die away. Uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> that uh, is they saw that uh, worldview uh, naturalism would eventually emerge as a consensus position for educated people. We now know uh, that not, is not, not to be the case. Uh, technology, differentiation, specialization and the broader disenchantment of much of practical everyday, everyday life and the pluralism of global communication and, and transportation may or may not undermine traditional theistic beliefs. In the, in the 1920s, Rudolf Bultmann famously and quaintly remarked, it is impossible to use the electric light and the wireless and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. Now, even in Boltman's day, the implied us uh, in that remark was a very select group. And today it depends a lot on where you are. In Western Europe, disenchantment is much more widespread than in the United States, and traditional religion is thri thriving along with modernization in much of the rest of the world. 20th century sociologists who typically had faith in progress based uh, on the spread of scientifically uh, based ideals may have been guilty of wishful thinking in projecting their own experiences of enlightened disenchantment on the rest of the world. Or the logic of their assumptions concerning science and progress may have made the connection just seem like common sense. In any case, it now seems apparent that the spread of methodological naturalism does not necessarily lead to the spread of metaphysical or worldview naturalism. 
Rather, the sometimes powerful connection between these two was artificially constructed and, in fact, based on circular reasoning. Excuse me. Of course, we need to take into account that human beings, being what they are, uh, have many reasons to be attracted to worldview naturalism other than on scientific grounds. Artists and others seeking secular liberation, for instance, going back to the 1920s, uh, might dismiss religious claims on intuitive or moral grounds or disillusioned intellectuals uh, of, of that era question, who questioned uh, all objectivity and regarded the human mind as imposing its socially conditioned and subjective uh, prejudice uh, on, on reality uh, were not basing that claim on strictly scientific grounds. But nonetheless, uh, natural science still provided the most common rationale for promoting and justifying naturalism uh, and the disenchanted of all, of, of all sorts, assumed a naturalistic evolutionary framework as basic for understanding the human uh, predicament. We also need to take into account, as Charles Taylor has uh, very complexly described in The Secular Age, that the rise of worldview naturalism was an international Western phenomenon whose roots went back uh, to before the Enlightenment and, and were, uh, was well advanced among philosophers by the 19th century. So, uh, so it is an international and 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 some so it's an international development, and not something that can be explained simply or even primarily in terms of American factors. Nonetheless, as my opening remarks suggest, the American developments do raise some interesting and revealing questions regarding the relationship of uh, Protestantism uh, in mainstream American culture to the rise of uh, naturalism. And that is, even though religiously based concerns, including moral concerns, were among the very things to be excluded by worldview naturalism, the vogue of that outlook as the chief contender for the consensus view uh, emerged in the mid 20th century when a Protestant presence was still intact in many formal ways at least on most campuses and, and that included considerable concern for the spiritual and moral welfare of students. In this uh, reflection to tonight, I'm just offering a statement of these historical questions and a broad overview of where I think the answers lie. Uh, in that respect, I, I'm here presenting uh, a, a prospectus uh, for a larger study uh, rather than a carefully documented set of conclusions. I'm also uh, elaborating on some themes that, that you can find in the soul of the American uh, University, but, but in a way going uh, a, a step beyond those themes. Before pr uh, proceeding with some analysis, uh, we need, I think, to uh, get past the confusing term secularization. And since this conference is winding down, uh, maybe I can say that at this point. Uh, particularly, uh, the paradox that worldview naturalism arose to eminence in the mainstream academy at the same time that many uh, Protestant university leaders were sincerely trying to maintain and even strengthen religious presence in universities, illustrates the point that we are dealing, uh, that, that what we are dealing with regarding religion in 20th century America is not secularization so much as the privatization of religion or its relocation, the privatization of religion or its relocation. Mainstream colleges, college and, and, uh, and university campuses uh, were increasingly being defined as public institutions, and religion was increasingly being moved to the private domain. It's, it's important to notice also that the privatization of religion could contribute to the vitalization of uh, religion. Worship in voluntary chapel, for instance, or under the auspices of competing denominational or non-denominational campus ministries was likely to be more spirited 
uh, than worship had been in uh, when, when chapel attendance was uh, required. So the real possibility of encouraging private religion provided compensation for effectively removing religion uh, from uh, the main business of universities, uh, the intellectual business of universities at least. Uh, hence, secularization is not a very helpful term to use regarding the mainstream American academy, uh, just as it is confusing when applied uh, to 20th century culture more generally. If we look at uh, just the curricular parts of the mainstream academy, it's more tempting to use secularization uh, since one major development was the separation of most intellectual activities from substantive religious concern. That would be my definition of secularization, is removal of some activity uh, from substantive religious concern. Uh, but even in this area, both privatization and differentiation are involved. So we're not talking about simply uh, uh, about simple secularization in the sense uh, of removal of religion from the curriculum. Many of the most respected universities uh, still had uh, divinity schools, and e in the mid 20th century, even state universities built and expanded religion departments. Furthermore, uh, the process of separating religious concern uh, from most of the curriculum had been going on, going on for, for centuries and, and had precedents uh, going back as far as uh, putting Aristotle in, into the curriculum. Uh, but in the 20th century, that separation of most of the curriculum from religious concerns was consolidated and articulated under uh, a more uh, definite modern rule. Rule. So rather than uh, using the, the confusing uh, and baseline dependent term secularization uh, for this development, I think it's most more helpful to describe it more precisely uh, by the terminology of the rise of methodological naturalism and of its uh, more radical cousin, uh, metaphysical or worldview naturalism. Well, in telling the story of how this developed, I, 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 there, are, there are three uh, books that have come out since the soul of the university that um, help tell this story. First, there's a book by Julie Rubin uh, called The Making of the Modern uh, University. And, and, and she very helpfully uh, tracks uh, three overlapping stages in the evolution of how American universities dealt with science, religion, and morality in the early 20th century. In the first uh, era, roughly from 1880 to 1910, uh, they tried to keep a place for Protestantism by jettisoning its divisive theology and emphasizing its unifying moral values so, so that it, uh, Protestantism would not conflict with the naturalistic claims of the rising uh, sciences. In the second stage, overlapping stage, from uh, 1900 to about 1920, Science and fair-minded scientific method uh, was to be the principal bearer of morality itself. But in the third stage, uh, from about 1915 to 1930, she puts it, uh, it was common to characterize the scientific method as separating fact from values. The humanities and the arts uh, could act as supplementary bear bearers of the Western tradition of higher ideals. Uh, but if one were to look for solid factual knowledge, it would have to be uh, through the scientific method. Uh, not only was religion marginalized by this outlook, says Rubin, uh, but so was morality. Uh, more recently, uh, Christian Smith, in a book called uh, Sociologist at Notre Dame, uh, it's called The Secular Revolution, adds valuable detail on how this naturalistic outlook emerged uh, as an explicitly anti-religious dogma in the field of sociology. Smith shows that from the late 19th century, uh, most leading academic sociologists were personally anti-religious and typically contrasted the scientific outlook uh, to dogmas of superstitious theology. And as followers of Auguste Comte, 
and Herbert Spencer, they assumed that religion in its dogmatic forms was dying out and the scientific outlook was the key to progress. Smith shows that such outlooks became an orthodoxy for academic sociologists by the early 20th century. Uh, and advocates of this uh, outlook uh, did not always make a clear distinction between a scientific or naturalistic methodology and a naturalistic ideology, but they simply used the method in such a way that greatly favored meta metaphysical naturalism. And that becomes particularly apparent, as Smith points out, uh, in their treatment of religion itself. Despite sometimes tipping their hats to religion as an area beyond science, they insisted nonetheless that religion uh, must be understood in the framework of cultural evolution and thus uh, reducing the chances that anyone would credit uh, traditional religious truth. Although I find Smith's account very helpful in documenting these developments, I'm less persuaded by uh, one of his central arguments that it was primarily the agency of these scholars uh, that made uh, metaphysical naturalism such a great success. Uh, their agency is indeed one factor, but the larger question remains why, as to why such secularizers would become so influential at this particular time and why uh, the claims of such social sciences would be so readily and so widely accepted in the early decades of the 20th century. Douglas Sloan, in a book, Faith and Knowledge, uh, Mainstream Protestantism and Higher Education, goes a long way to showing why serious mainline Protestants did not challenge this emerging academic orthodoxy more forcefully. After World War II, says Sloan, the, uh, World War I, uh, said Sloan, uh, the faith knowledge issue uh, remained a crucial one among churches and theologians, but it ceased to be an issue uh, in American higher education, mainstream education. In effect, mainstream Protestant leaders accepted the fact-value dichotomy and were content to claim for their churches and voluntary religious groups the role of defining values. Uh, that move uh, also uh, involved a considerable theological reconstruction in order to make theology science-proof. Uh, so theology had mainly to do with authenticating moral values and religious sensibilities. Ironically, this dualism also made almost all the rest of intellectual inquiry theology proof. <laughs> so assumptions of a naturalistic method uh, could, uh, could uh, reign over most of the curriculum. Thus, as Sloan shows, by the 1950s, mainline Protestant leaders were uh, making some very well-funded efforts to deal with the faith and knowledge issues but they were not generating substantial alternatives for most of the university curricula, uh, curricula where uh, naturalistic assumptions prevailed. Rather, they granted wide authority to the assumptions of the natural scientific method as though it were essentially a neutral enterprise. And then they supplemented it with theological concerns or occasional critiques uh, when purely naturalistic claims uh, were carried too far. And in fact, despite sometimes knowing better, by conceding such large territories to the naturalistic method uh, that, uh, <clears throat> by conceding such large territories to the naturalistic method that theology was forced uh, into a supplementary role uh, on the outlying territories. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so Protestant educa ed educational leaders uh, could point out that the naturalistic scientific method uh, was good in, it, in its place, but that did not imply, they said, that spiritual things and the supernatural were not as important as ever in their domains. Spiritual matters, they said, were just another level of uh, concern. So the problem, I think, in the mid-20th century was, was not that mainstream Protestant leaders, and they put a lot of funding into the faith and knowledge issue in the 1950s, uh, th it wasn't that they failed to make the distinction between what I'm calling a metaphysical, uh, I can't remember which is which, uh, between <laughs> methodological naturalism and worldview naturalism, but uh, rather that they did recognize some such dis distinction, but used it in a dualistic way that allowed 
methodological naturalism virtually full reign in the supposedly independent territory uh, uh, and in, in, in independent territories of most of academia and always pointing out that there's still room for theology, uh, personal religious experience, and uh, religiously based morality uh, that went, these things that went beyond science. Not wanting to sound like fundamentalists, which is a very big uh, motive at the time, not wanting to sound like fundamentalists, they could affirm the findings of modern science, but always point out that modern science had arisen largely under the auspices of Protestant theism uh, and still could be seen as safe uh, so long as theological options remained. That solution made a lot of sense because it had worked ever since the rise of modern science. Protestant culture and full openness to scientific investigation had long uh, proven themselves compatible. The fact of the matter was that mainstream Protestant, uh, the pro mainstream Protestant presence, however, uh, was fading fast in the mid 20th century, uh, something uh, that uh, was obscured by view by the religious revival of the 1940s and the 1950s, uh, but which became uh, dramatically uh, uh, apparent uh, in the 1960s when, when Protestant uh, presence on campuses suddenly uh, uh, disappeared or declined dramatically. Now my critique of the mainstream Protestant response to the rise of naturalistic uh, ways of doing things in the academy and, and that becoming the dominant uh, uh, viewpoint, my critique assumes uh, that there is an alternative uh, way uh, to the way things actually went. And one might imagine that in a nation that had very strong and active churches and in which most of the parishioners uh, were uh, somewhat traditional in their theology, uh, that leading Protestants might have more effectively uh, challenged uh, as the intellectual norm uh, uh, naturalism uh, throughout the, the university curricula. Well, in the Netherlands, uh, in fact, we do find uh, one Protestant faction, uh, that shaped by Abraham Kuyper, uh, promoting the alternative insight that methodological naturalism was not neutral philosophically. One might, Kuyper said, uh, employ a naturalistic methodology within a Christian theistic framework, uh, or uh, one might uh, apply a naturalistic uh, methodology within some other uh, uh, framework. Uh, as a, a, a non-theistic uh, framework. So uh, very famously, Kuiper said, uh, there are two kinds of people and two kinds of science, not meaning uh, that theists and non-theists non were using different uh, procedures in the natural sciences or in the social sciences, uh, but uh, that they understood the larger implications of their sciences in radically different frameworks. Uh, but in the United States, uh, however, no such alternative uh, outlook took uh, deep root, at least not in mainstream uh, Protestantism or in higher education through the middle decades uh, of the 20th century. So we can ask, well, what was the basic difference uh, between what was going on in Dutch Protestantism and American Protestantism so that this alternative view appeared prominently in the one and uh, not prominently, only marginally in the other. Well, I think a number of factors are significant and, and I can't explore all of those, uh, but one that strikes me as particularly important is that Abraham Kuyper was the, the leader of a major secession from the state church in Holland. Uh, and so uh, as a result of that, he developed a different sense of religious and theological pluralism. Uh, than the one that was commonly found in the United States. Since the United States had no established national church uh, from the beginning, uh, its religious life was dominated by a coalition of Protestants who built an informal religious establishment. And from the beginning, the challenge for this estab Protestant establishment was to fashion a moral basis for unifying the republic 
uh, and re religion uh, had been uh, assumed to be the, the basis uh, for finding the virtue that republics depended upon. And for that purpose, mainstream uh, Protestantism developed, as Mark Knoll has shown very well, a close relationship with the constructive aspects of Enlightenment thought, uh, including a very high regard for natural science. And that synthesis provided the basis for the project of developing a common set of ideals in the 19th century to which all Americans ought to be uh, assimilated. This, this was the Protestant uh, ideal and certainly the ideal uh, in, uh, in the colleges. Uh, and these consensus cult cultural ideals always included a strong anti-Catholic element and continued to do so into the 1950s. By the early 20th century, Protestant religion itself, even of the liberal ethical variety, became increasingly problematic as a plausible basis for cultural unity. So Protestant leaders in, in, uh, therefore relied increasingly on the scientific side uh, for uh, building this consensus and promoting uh, progress, a stance that put them in alliance with most secular uh, intellectuals. In the United States then, uh, both Protestant and non-religious thinkers agreed that one purpose of the scientific method was to combat sectarianism and to build consensus. So it was very difficult uh, for American Protestants in the 20th century, uh, in, in the mainstream Protestants of the 20th century, century, to regard the scientific method, as Kuiper did, as itself operating within a plurality, I can't say it, uh, of uh, uh, religious or uh, non-religious uh, viewpoints. It was very difficult then for mainstream American thinkers to regard the scientific method as uh, Abraham Kuyper did as itself operating within a plurality, still can't say it, of religious and, and or, or non-religious uh, frameworks. So. Uh, for a few years, in the early 1960s, after the post-World War II religious revivals had receded, uh, and particularly in the early 1960s, this, this attitude is very striking, leading American intellectuals could imagine that worldview naturalism provided the pragmatic bedrock on which a secular conses consensus of, uh, tech, uh, of, of techno technological America would rest. In more popular culture, there was much talk of competing with the USSR in scientific education and technology. And it was common for people to say in the early 1960s that if we could put a, a man into space, uh, we ought to be able to solve the problems of racism and poverty. I remember hearing that as late as 1966. Uh, Protestant theologians embraced the secular. But then a, a funny thing happened on the way to the secular city. <laughs> Suddenly, in the later uh, 1960s, it was widely proclaimed that the whole consensus thing was a fraud and a tool of the WASP establishment. The te technological society was the problem, and even natural science itself came to be seen as not neutral or objective. The social sciences were tools of the ruling classes and reflected the biases of their practitioners. Well, in the 40 years since uh, then, we have all been trying to make sense uh, of these revolutionary claims of the later 1960s. And most of the most promising outcomes suggest the best answers uh, lie somewhere between the extremes of the old and the new. But if one thing is clear, it is that the idea of objectivity or of an unbiased neutrality of scientific methods, especially when applied to matters beyond the technical questions of natural science itself, uh, have long since lost the default status uh, that could be complacently claimed for them as simply being objective, as, as they could be claimed uh, in uh, the middle decades of the 20th century. As I observed earlier, worldview naturalism, although it has uh, many proponents, uh, some of whom are increasingly vocal, it's now generally seen as one view among many. Methodological naturalism is still ubiquitous, uh, but today it is far easier to gain assent to the proposition that scientifically based accounts of reality uh, of the larger issues of life 
uh, rather, the scientifically based accounts of the larger issues of, of life are not ideologically neutral, but are controlled by context and assumptions uh, of, of within which they are operating. We have, of course, uh, a long way to go. In mainstream academia, there has been some time lag, I think, in applying the implications of this recognition of a plurality, I uh, said it right, a plurality of outlooks uh, to the traditional religious beliefs themselves. The practice of keeping religious convictions and intellectual enterprises in separate compartments was so firmly established by the mid 20th century that it's been a very difficult convention to dislodge. In part, uh, its residual hold on mainstream ap academia grows out of the uh, technical nature of most of academic inquiry itself. In non-technical uh, areas, however, prejudices against traditional religious perspectives are fueled not only by intellectual objections uh, to the claims that, uh, that, that, you know, that religious claims that many academics see as fantastic, uh, but also, uh, I think, by political th fears uh, that encouraging such outlooks may open the door for the religious right and for a social agenda that uh, many, probably most, academics despise. So there's little incentive in mainstream academia for re-examining re the old dualistic rules that say that religious perspectives are one thing uh, that needs to be checked at the academic door. Nonetheless, with the intellectual case much weakened for the claim that worldview naturalism represents a neutral, objective, or emerging consensus outlook, I think there is hope that the mainstream academia may be, be at least beginning to uh, change to be more open to hearing the case for including intellectually sound religious perspectives among the perspectives that can take a place at the table. But while such intellectual con consider considerations may help make the change possible, I, I think there's a much larger factor uh, that is making that change actually happen. Uh, and, and that larger factor, I think, uh, is a factor that's documented by Michael Lindsay, a, a Baylor graduate, I, I think, uh, uh, who documents in his recent book, Faith in the Halls of Power, the recent surge of talented younger scholars uh, of traditional faith who are simply doing excellent academic work. And such scholars, and, and here we have a room full uh, of them, are demonstrating that they can relate uh, uh, their faith to their scholarship in ways that are consistent with the highest standards of academic rigor. But at the same time, they're showing that engaging uh, in largely naturalistic methodology, in th at the same time they're showing that engaging in largely naturalistic methodologies need not entail nor even favor a naturalistic view of all reality. So thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we, as has been our practice, we have microphones for people who have uh, questions. So please come on up with, uh, with any questions that you have. And if you could identify yourself uh, in your institution when you ask your question, that would be great. I didn't know I was first. Um, I'm not so much of an intellectual historian, but I've been wrestling with these questions too. And um, how do you respond to the argument, the, author, the, other, the other argument that's out there among the non-intellectual historians who are talking about the Scopes trial as the big sort of transitional moment and the transitional sort of time where people like Clarence Darrow and the ACLU are really pushing for this argument that methodological naturalism and all sorts of scientific naturalism are much more m sort of important to see as the status quo and the, the normal sort of intellectual thing to do. And how do you respond to the argument that this is the, the reason why the, for this transition was the, the ACLU and the labor movement and Cl Clarence Darrow and that sort of leftist push? 
Yeah, well, that's, that's a very good question, and it's a crucial moment in this in this story, and I, I didn't go into it other than mentioning that mainstream Protestants didn't want to seem fundamentalist. But it seems to me that the problem was that uh, William Jennings Bryan and, and other fundamentalists had correctly identified worldview naturalism as the threat, uh, and, and you know, that, that, that that was uh, rising uh, in, in influence at the time. But they addressed what is essentially a philosophic or a theological issue as, as though it were an argument about the details of natural science. And I think that's been the problem uh, with both creation science and, and intelligent design, that uh, th the, the issues that they're raising are very fundamental issues, but they're not going to be settled by some sort of scientific evidence or other, because if you're doing science within the framework of a worldview that says uh, the only, th you know, the only causes that we are, or we'll uh, consider are natural causes. If you knock down one scientific view, they would simply come up with the next best scientific uh, naturalistic explanation and say, this is the best explanation that all right-thinking people uh, should, should, should uh, agree to. So uh, addressing a philosophical issue as though it were uh, an issue to be settled by, by uh, you know, scientific argument, uh, put fundamentalists on the, on the wrong track and uh, pushed a lot of other Protestants in the direction of saying, we don't want to look like those fundamentalists. We're completely open to uh, you know, naturalistic ways of understand, uh, un understanding things, but we're reserving, you know, of course, theology up there. And I think that tended to, to eventually erode uh, a lot of, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, eventually er er erode their theological credibility as well. Um, I was wondering, are you, it seems to me that you are basically suggesting that secularism steps into a breach between um, Catholics and Protestants in the United States, and that, and I, I think Frank Turner was suggesting something similar, that the, the division among Christians is essentially to blame for the rise of secularization, and that what we need to do is recapture what I think Jose Casanova was suggesting, a, an understanding of the, the historic relationship between the Christian church and scientific naturalism, um, that what we need to do is get rid of that central myth that um, between antiquity and modernity, there is no scientific thought going on. We need to get rid of the idea that Christopher Columbus uh, discovered that the earth was round and the stupid Spanish monks at Salamanca thought it was flat. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that essentially we, we need to come together in a, in a thorough understanding of, of our own Christian history. Yeah, uh, it, it's, I mean, the irony of the history is Protestantism was, was indeed in, in general, very open to, uh, to the scientific method. And uh, by the late 19th century, Protestants often were uh, defining themselves as we are people who stand for freedom as opposed to Catholics who stand for authoritarianism uh, and the like. And, and, and that, uh, you know, the, the, the more they embraced, I mean, there were good reasons to embrace freedom, uh, but it, it also, uh, Sort of opened the door to, um, to, to 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 their their own points of view becoming uh, becoming marginalized. But 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 then I, I think the you know in in in, in understanding that history, I also think uh, what needs I mean what I'm trying to emphasize is it needs to be seen that it's not natural science that's the um, that's the enemy. Uh, but it's a framework through which science, you know, through which science is being approached. That's a crucial issue, and and and, and that that wasn't seen so clearly in in the mid 20th century because of a Protestantism's love affair with uh, 
with, with, with natural science and they just thought, well, it's a neutral, they acted as though it was, were, were a neutral kind of enterprise and, and, and it's not. So uh, you know, it, it, it's a way of saying, yes, we should recover uh, the, 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 the Protestant and, and Christian uh, friendliness uh, to natural science, but don't have any illusion that natural science is, is, is a neutral enterprise. It's, it's done by people from particular perspectives, from particular social locations, and one of the social locations uh, is uh, you know, religious uh, locations, and, and, that, and that makes all the difference in, in what implications you see uh, from the natural scientific method. Um, Jose Casanova. Um, I want to raise a paradox. Uh, I understand that you are mainly interested in the American case in looking for alternative possibilities. And I am only raising it because you've raised the alternative of, of Holland. Um, and let's look at Germany. Uh, the German university institutionalized theology within the university as one of the sciences, much more systematically than in the American university. And um, methodological naturalism never triumphed because you had a dualism. You have the dualism methodological stride between the natural sciences and the cultural sciences, hermeneutic sciences, that has maintained itself as a dualism within uh, German uh, science. And it's accepted that the cultural sciences are also sciences, even if they don't share the methodological naturalism. So in this respect, uh, you have the paradox that Methodological naturalism has not triumphed in the universities, and yet the naturalist worldview has triumphed in society to a larger extent than here. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is that here you have the triumph of uh, metho metaphysical naturalism in the universities, but not in society. While there you have, it has not dominated the university, but dominated society. So. Well, that's very interesting, and, and, and that's the kind of feedback I was looking for because I, I, I am limited by looking at this through the lens of the American experience and part of the problem is the, the American intellectual experience in, uh, you know, through the mid-20th century was very dependent on what they're picking up from, from European uh, kinds of influences so it's, 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 it's uh, not mainly American story, but that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Professor Marston. Um, Aaron Smith from Colorado Christian University. I'm wondering if, uh, in, in terms of your now uh, quite wide-ranging experience in, in different uh, institutions, if uh, you could uh, um, uh, give us some, some um, maybe speculative insights into what you think might be coming down the pike, so to speak, um, or what you would like, what, what, what might you suggest? Or it, 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 I'm wondering specifically if you are suggesting that perhaps if, um, if theology played a larger role in constructing this worldview as an alternative to worldview natural, so, some alternative to worldview naturalism. Uh, if that uh, is, is that what you're, uh, is that what you're kind of uh, uh, suggesting, or, and, and if so, is uh, what, what's your prognosis for that? I suppose at an institution like Notre Dame, for instance, or, or Duke, and um, but but I'm wondering, uh, part of what I'm getting at is where is where is the alternative going to come from, to worldview naturalism? And well, I I, I think it. I mean, I, as I said, I think it is coming, particularly uh, everywhere, every school I go to, there, there are a lot of graduate students who are dedicated Christians, Catholics or Protestants, who are doing ex excellent work. And they're coming into the academy and, 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 and that's just changing things. But, you know, by, you know, p people are thinking about that. But it's also that what I'm saying is, what I think is very important is that there needs to be consciousness raising about doing the, your discipline through the lens 
of of your Christian commitment, and 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 that does you know, it, it doesn't mean it's going to change the, the science part of your discipline, but it does change the you know, the, the implications of, of of the discipline, and I, I think it's like gender and scholarship that it's something that does make a difference, but there aren't a lot of people thinking about hard about what difference it makes. And when people started thinking about what difference gender made, they saw it made, well, well this really changes things and doesn't mean you're not doing good scholarship, it just means you see it from, from, from a new angle. And, and I think that's very important. I just uh, read a piece in uh, Sociology of Religion, uh, a study, I think in the May issue, of the um, religious belief among American college and university professors. And the basic thrust of the study is to say uh, there's a lot more uh, professors out there who say that they are religious, and, and, and some pretty traditionally religious, uh, than, 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 than most people think. It's not as high as the national average, but it, it's a lot higher than, than, than the, uh, the picture, and even at elite, elite universities. Uh, there, there's quite a few people there, but there aren't very many people there who are thinking about what difference their religious perspectives make, and 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 that you know that that's sort of my my plea to people. Uh, you know, it, need, it needs to be thought hard about. Um, in your story, you talked a lot about the the mark the marginalization of theology in academia. And I wanted to ask about the, the role of academic theology in this story, because it seems to me that academic theology as it currently exists is not very well positioned to develop a compelling alternative to worldview naturalism, because I'm a social scientist, but whenever I talk to academic theologians, I'm always surprised. I, I always think I'm the sociologist. I have to take this methodological naturalism for granted, but theologians surely are out there developing a compelling alternative worldview, but I'm often quite disappointed, and the theologians that I most respect are quite marginal within academic theology. They're either practitioners or they're biblical scholars, not primarily theologians, and it seems to me that part of this something, part of the story has to be of something that happened within academic theology so that it's, it's no longer um, things in academic theology that could have been developing a prophetic alternative were marginalized as, you know, f fideism or, you know, not, not serious or not intellectually rigorous. And I was wondering, if you, I'm, I'm not an intellectual historian. Do you have mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the problem is one, one of the reasons that mainstream Protestants could accept the way things were going in, in mainstream ac ac academia was they still had their divinity schools. And, and so there was a structural kind of thing. Or they started religion departments that in the 1950s were, had curricula that were sort of like Protestant divinity schools. And, uh, but you know, religion was, was, was a separate discipline and, and the divinity schools were pretty marginalized from the, the rest of what was going on in the university. So I taught at Duke Divinity School, and e even though Duke Divinity School has a very prominent place in the university uh, structure uh, and, and tradition, it, nonetheless, it doesn't have uh, much of any influence on anything else going on, on in the university. It's just, it, it's a specialized discipline. So uh, it, it isn't, it doesn't play any integrative Role in in the university because it's been been separated out and 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 that's it, it's it's it also means I think that those of us who are religious believers and are scholars need to uh, to, to to beef up our theology ourselves that what part of the problem in relating faith to scholarship is that people will have a, a Sunday school level of, of faith, it may, you know, maybe sort of high level Sunday school, but, but still a Sunday school level of faith, 
but they have a PhD in their discipline. And so relating the two is, is kind of an unequal yoking kind of, kind of thing. So I, I think it's important to have study groups or go to seminars and, and the like where, um, where, where, where people in a discipline are thinking theologically and, and does this theology have any implications for, um, for the rest of what we're doing. And, 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 and that's an enterprise that we, we need all, you know, all to sort of keep working at. Thank you very much, Dr. Marsden, for this uh, very stimulating discussion. Uh, my name is Sam Smith from Liberty University. You mentioned that we sort of got off track with uh, an emphasis on intelligent design and creation science and so forth. What would you say to the uh, young person who is a dedicated Christian who wants to go into things like uh, biology and, uh, and the sciences? Because there is a, you know, more students going into that uh, who have really been inspired by intelligent design and so forth. So what role do they play in confronting this uh, uh, metaphysical naturalism? Well, I, 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 I think um, I think it's good for you know, dedicated Christian scholars to go in, in, into biology, uh, but I, I don't think the 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 the, uh, the issue of biological evolution is going to be settled by some uh, you know particular scientific argument. I I, I think it's 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 much better to uh, emphasize that the way that that it really is at, at heart a uh, a philosophical sort of issue, so that my longtime colleague, uh, Alvin Planiga, deals with some issues that, that, that are uh, the same issues that intelligent design works with, but, but, but they don't rely on particular scientific sort of, sort, sorts of issues. So, and, 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 and so it seems to me that's the, the, the level at, at, at which the argument can be can be well sustained, and Christians can, you know, really, I mean, uh, can show that that that, that there's you know, that scientific naturalism is 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 a circular kind of thinking. It's simply uh, a a conclusion that's consistent with the premises that it's built on. And Christian theism uh, is, you know, another premise that you can see the world through, and 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 everything will make sense. Uh, including biology in, in what, you know, whatever you find uh, in, in that framework. Hello, I'm Kate Sedgwick. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. And my question is directly related to the fact that I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. So one of my committee advisors is Bruce Kuklick. And he has, over the years, uh, made some comments that I've been thinking quite a lot about, and I'm curious to hear your response to them. And it's related also to what you were saying about how there's lots of Christians everywhere that you that you go who are doing excellent work, and who, if I understand you correctly, are using sort of using a naturalistic methodology, but not not in a context of a naturalistic worldview. Mm -hmm. Professor Kuklick's criticism of historians who operate this way, and I'm sure that you know this, is that uh, they fail to tell the truth about what they really believe about what happened in the past because they don't use supernatural explanations, whereas as Christians, we think there are supernatural explanations. So I'm just eager to hear you respond to his thoughts. Yeah, that, 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 that Bruce Kuklick is uh, about my age or older, and, and, and he's, he's certainly of the generation of people who, who are true believe. I mean, he, True believers in, um, in 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 that, and 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 Bruce, who's sort of a friend, also ha you know just has fits about my view and the outrageous idea of Christian scholarship. That title basically is a response to something that Bruce said in the in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education about about my my first 
my, 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 my first book, I forget the exact word, but it was, it, it was something that, that would be in the thesaurus on the same page as crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, and, and, and Bruce and I have talked and corresponded, and he just thinks that we are inconsistent because we use a, a uh, rigorous historical methodology when doing American history, and you know, why don't we do this with respect to, uh, to, to, to the Bible? And, and, and he just doesn't take the point that uh, you can have a, a, a whole view of things that, that's more open to the possibility of what you're saying is a supernatural or might, you know, might be better to have, I mean, I like Jonathan Edwards, a sort of sensibility that uh, there, there's a presence of God throughout reality. So it's, it's you know, th th that's, it, there's an openness to that. And, and, and so it's not inconsistent with your basic view of things that, uh, you know, in, in, in some parts, you know, in, in some ways you see that, but you can also uh, analyze, um, you know, the, 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 the natural the natural things uh, th things around you and 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 I see that as a, a as a consistent worldview uh, whereas Bruce is is very much dedicated to the idea that uh, if you're you know if you're consistently naturalistic well then you you have to be consistently skeptical of of any religious uh, religious claim but but I think that's I mean, for whatever reasons, that's that's his premise as well as his conclusion, and my premise as well as my conclusion is based on my, my, you know, theological affinities and you know what I, you know, as, as uh, James A. K. Smith puts it, you know, what what you love is 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 the framework for you know for. How you how you understand reality, and 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 you can be a lover of God uh, and doing doing natural science, and 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 those two things are, are quite consistent with each other. Hi, William Weaver, Baylor University. Thank you, Professor Marston, for your talk. And I was thinking about um, the why why mainstream Christians were not able to articulate some articulate an idea of naturalism as one option among many. Uh, and so I, I had a question about that, or actually an answer to that, and I'd like you to respond to the answer. It's not my answer. It's uh, uh, J. Gresham Machen's answer in, in 1921 or so, Christianity and li liberalism, that the reason was that, that, that they're not Christians at all, um, that, these, uh, that the uh, mainstream Christian leaders were not Christian. So first of all, is Machen talking about the same people that you are? Is his attack addressed to the same people? Uh, uh, is there any validity to his um, attack that they are not Christians but theists of some sort? And then finally, I'd like you, if, if it's okay, I'd like you to reflect on that response and where that kind of response has a place in the story that you're telling about the uh, the, uh, the naturalism, uh, metaphysical, the metaphysical naturalism taking over the university. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I grew up in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and so I grew up on, on J. Gresham Machen, and, he, and, and, and I think he, the, the argument there is, is, is correct that certain kinds of theological liberals had moved uh, so far away from traditional Christianity that, that, that it was another kind of religion that, that, that they were advocating. I don't think it, it, it's true, though, that that was... It, the, the issue in the 1920s was really the tolerance of such, such people. It wasn't as though everybody in mainline Protestant churches uh, were, were liberal. I, I think... Uh, so, so there were a lot of people who... Uh, were genuine Christians, but might have you know, not 
not been as theologically rigorous as as, as Machen would have would have liked them to be. But but the the issue is is, is certainly related because I mean to what I'm saying in that. Uh, that's the, the, the kind of liberal Christianity that, that was becoming very widespread in, in theology in the mid-20th century was one that, that, that was based on things that would, as I said, would, would be science proof. That you emphasize uh, personal religious experience or truths of the heart that, 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 that can't be challenged or the ethical dimensions, the teachings of Jesus uh, as the, the essence of Christianity. And, and then no, no amount of scientific uh, challenge is, is, is going to knock that down. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that sort of theological response is partly a response to seeing natural science as, as dissolving traditional Christianity. And it's partly, uh, largely, uh, because a, a natural scientific method or, or naturalism, naturalistic method was applied to the Bible, and people said, well, the Bible should be understood just like any other book, and, and just as a methodological issue. And if you, you say that methodologically, you pretty much sold the farm because then, then the Bible's going to look like the Iliad as uh, a book that uh, you, you, you look at, I mean, it, it, its religious claims aren't going to have uh, a compelling. Um, uh, answer for you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Marson. Brad Green at Union University. If William Weaver can raise Machen, I'm going to raise uh, Cornelius Van Til. Uh, um, yeah, this discussion is particularly interesting given Baylor's history and, and Michael Beatty's study on the two spheres view and all at, 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 at Baylor. Um, in our response to naturalism, uh, is it then at the heart of the matter, is it important to then press uh, naturalists at the level of presuppositions? And here I'm thinking of uh, the Little Rock creationist trial where the creationists came and said, hey, you're doing science and we can do science better and we'll show you why our science is better. And the response is, is that, um, no, you're really doing theology. Don't try to tell us you're doing science. That's the response to the creationists. Is the better Christian response, rather than saying, hey, we're going to do science, we're going to do it better, and we're, we're not thinking Christianly, we're not thinking theologically, we're just doing pure science. Uh, are you suggesting, or might it be the case that at that trial or at any kind of response to naturalism, is it the case that we should simply say, yep, we're doing theology, or we're doing ultimate philosophy, and everyone is in every discipline and try to push people at the level of uh, their ultimate uh, philosophical or theological presuppositions. Yeah, I, I, yeah that, that's in the line of what I'm, I'm saying, and, and Van Til you know, is in the Kuyperian tradition, and, and I actually studied with Van Til, uh, so, so he's, he, he, he's, he's an influence, and, and, and I think, I, 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 I like Van Til as modified by Edwards to say it's not just sort of the intellectual presuppositions, but, but it's sort of the, you know, where, where, where are your affections and, and you know, that, that your affections uh, shape the way you perceive, perceive things and the, way you, and, and, and the way you value things so that we're not, nobody's, standing, nobody's standing on neutral ground. 